Good Monday afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to Weather on the Go, all your weather coverage. In today's video, we'll be focusing on a super El Nino potentially developing as we get deeper into the summer and into the fall of 2023. And we'll be focusing in on the weather pattern throughout the summer and what to expect through the month of September of 2023 in this video, followed by your tropical season forecast, what to expect throughout the hurricane season. I'll answer those questions later on in today's video. But first, let's understand what El Nino is. So let's look here at the sea surface temperature anomalies here currently across the equatorial Pacific. You see we have a lot of oranges and reds here mainly from the Central Americas, South America on westward here over the Central Pacific here. And this is very important because as you look at our El Nino, as it's been developing over the past couple of months, going all the way back to the beginning of April, we were in a El Nino pattern starting here with the positive values here on April 17th. Then we started growing a little bit more, a little bit more all the way through the middle of May. We had it at plus 0.5. And then going all the way here to present day, it's already up to about a weak El Nino status. So what does this mean moving forward? Well, we got to determine what the difference is between La Nina versus El Nino. So looking at this, we are currently trending into El Nino status. That's where we have the warmer sea surface temperatures across portions of the Central Pacific or better known as the Equatorial Pacific Ocean. When you have a La Nina event occurring, that's when you see cooler than normal sea surface temperatures across the equatorial or Pacific or the central Pacific Ocean. So that is what we are seeing. We are seeing El Nino conditions prevail and now we have to determine the difference here in what this means for our weather pattern in North America. So with a La Nina, which we just got out of a three-year La Nina, you usually have more drier conditions across the southern and southeastern United States because the Pacific jet stream is further to the north and it's more variable as well. So that brings more precipitation to the upper Midwest, the Great Lakes, and also the Ohio Valley. But now as we're trending into El Nino, we're starting to see more more signs of a active subtropical and Pacific jet stream amplifying across the California region, southern United States, and up the East Coast, and shutting off a lot of that northern jet stream for the northern plains, the upper Midwest, the Great Lakes, and even to some extent the Northeast as well. And that's where we have the wetter conditions across the southern United States. So now we kind of look at what to expect through an El Nino summer. I know we're just starting to go into an El Nino. This is not really a full El Nino summer per se. But from May to September, this is your temperature anomalies. Wherever you see the green on this map, that's where you're slightly below average with the temperatures when putting all the El Nino events together here to present day. And where you see the whites, that's just average temperatures for any given El Nino event. But then we go looking here at the precipitation anomalies, and you do see some differences here. So you start to see average to slightly above average precipitation favored, mainly across the center. United States across the Great Plains and the Mississippi Valley with drier conditions prevailing really for the Northeast here into the Ohio Valley and Mid-Atlantic states, especially where you see the yellows here and the oranges departuring below normal precipitation. And it, very interesting on this is where it shows especially a signal into Southern and Southeastern Arizona for slightly below average precipitation, usually from May to September during El Nino events, lately we have been seeing slightly below average signal for precipitation, which directly will affect the monsoon season across those areas. We'll get into that here shortly as well. So when you put all of that together and look at what we are seeing right now, this is the U.S. drought monitor here that was produced last Thursday, and we are seeing a lot of significant drought developing across the central plains, the upper Midwest, the Ohio Valley, and into some degree the Northeast as well. And this is very significant when you see an El Nino summer start to emerge and an El Nino event nonetheless start to emerge. We see a lot of severe drought, extreme, and even exceptional drought starting to develop across the middle of the country. And now we look at the U.S. seasonal drought outlook that goes from now all the way through the end of September here 
and it does not show much improvement across the Ohio Valley, parts of the Midwest, and really actually seeing more of the drought expanding and intensifying as we go further on through the summer and into early fall with a developing El Nino. But now we start to see a signal in the central plains into South Dakota, western Iowa, getting into Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, and parts of Missouri. We start to get out of our drought conditions the further we get into late summer summer and into early fall. So now we start to see a flip-flop with our pattern with wetter conditions under the underneath here and then drier conditions across the northern United States, across the Great Lakes, the Midwest, and the Ohio Valley. So now we look forward to the overall weather pattern. So we are in June now, but now as we push into July next month, we will start to see an anchored high pressure system develop across the southern and southwestern United States. Generally, over those traditional monsoonal season areas here across Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona. We start to determine whether or not we see northwest flow over the top of this, and it does look like we do start to see that across the upper Midwest and to some degree the Ohio Valley through the month of July. But what this means for a temperature perspective, it's going to be very stifling warm, especially if you live in Canada. For this time of year, the departure from normal, these temperatures are going to be well above normal through the Canadian provinces, the upper Midwest, and the Ohio Valley. So I do expect a very high very steamy July if you live across Canada, the upper Midwest, and also the Ohio Valley into the Northeast. We still see a slightly above average temperatures across the South, but it's not as extreme as further to the North, but I definitely will expect some very high heat index values like we've been seeing lately to extend into July across the Southern United States. And now turning to precipitation through July, I do expect the monsoon weather to actually hold off for the most part. We may see some some rain events at times, but I think the monsoon season will be muted for the most part through July and we'll have most of the precipitation across the central and southern plains and the southeast as we go through the month of July with a little drier signal again, unfortunately with the feedback of the drought up here uh, persisting with drier conditions from Wisconsin all the way to the mid-Atlantic states. So that will be expected through the month of July. Now as we turn to August, not too much of a change. We still have that anchored high pressure system. It may actually strengthen a little bit more through the month of August. I do actually think the month of August will be the hottest for the northern United States for the northern plains, the upper Midwest and the Great Lakes region and parts of the Canadian provinces as well well with the highest signal across southeastern Canada. But you see underneath this, we have a lot of these whites and even some light blues showing up. That's average to slightly below average temperatures for Texas, the Dixie Alley region, and over here into the southeast through the month of August. And the reason for that is that active subtropical jet just continues to remain parked across the southern United States. So we'll see active weather, some severe weather possible, also some very heavy rainfall events possible across the southern plains into the lower Mississippi Valley with a drier signal across the monsoonal areas and over the top of that ridge at times across the upper Midwest as well um, with some drier than normal temperatures. Again, with the feedback of that drought through the month of August. August. Now, finally, we go into September. We start to flatten out that ridge just a little bit further to the south, so I expect the heat to remain across the southern plains, the southern Four Corners region, and into Mexico more. Um, so we'll start to de-amplify the pattern as we go in towards September. What this means for temperatures? Well, for September standards, it does look like a hot September if you look at this map, but I promise you it will be warm, but not nearly as hot as what we saw in July or August. And remember, as we go deeper in through 2023 into fall, we're going to start to see those temperature averages start to slow down a little bit and trend cooler. So even though you see above average anomalies on here, does not mean you're going to see 100 degree heat through September, just means that the September overall will be warm across the majority of North America. And what this means for precipitation, it's kind of a mixed signal right now of around average precipitation through the month of September. Maybe a little pocket of hope of some precipitation up here in the upper Midwest. We could hope for that after a very dry middle to late summer up here. But we still continue with the signal down here to the Four Corners region in the Western Plains 
explains that monsoon season really not getting going too much even through September. So that is something to keep an eye on. So with that said, my monsoonal season forecast for 2023, I do expect slightly below average precipitation across those traditional monsoonal areas. So for Colorado, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, and parts of the Baja of California, I really don't see much of a monsoon season for you. Yes, you could see some rain from time to time, but I'm expecting it overall, the monsoon season from now through September to be very weak across these areas here and not really that significant. So below average precipitation for the monsoon season across those areas. Now turning to my severe weather forecast through the rest of summer, I did kind of update this from the last update earlier on here this month. I do expect more likely, if not very likely, severe weather weather, especially in these orange and red shaded colors. So if you live into the Northern Plains, down through the Missouri Valley, into the Tennessee Valley here, that's where the areas are expected to get more frequent severe weather events, possibly a couple of significant weather events with MCSs, those mesoscale convective systems, possibly a couple of derechos potentially through the rest of summer. But it is possible anywhere along and east of the Rockies that we do see severe weather. Again, it is the warm season, so we always have to watch out for severe weather. Whether you're in New Mexico, Texas, Florida, or even into Maine, we will continue to monitor that through the rest of summer. Turning to the tropical weather update, this is the accumulated precipitation anomaly through July. I do expect a lot of these tropical waves through July to remain further to the south than we usually do see them for July because of a stronger Bermuda high pressure system. The model here is starting to signal maybe the Lesser Antilles, the Caribbean could get very active, but then there's a signal as well that it doesn't really quite get into the Western Caribbean or the Gulf as frequently through July. So maybe there's some hope for the Southeastern United States that, hey, maybe July won't be a big month for hurricanes or tropical storms making land fall towards the United States, especially as we get deeper into El Nino conditions. So the prognosis here for July is that these tropical waves could develop. They'll move into the eastern Pacific and then kind of fall apart or move across the Central Americas into the eastern Pacific side and make the eastern Pacific uh, Ocean a little bit more active for the tropics through July. Then as we go into August, that Bermuda High may move a little bit further north and northeast here, which would lift the active tropical waves a little bit further north. And I do actually think August could be one of the biggest months for the potential of landfalling systems in towards the greater Antilles, the Bahamas, or even the United States proper here. So I do think that we are going to see a bigger month for August as this lifts a little further north. So portions of Puerto Rico, Cuba, the Dominican Republic, the Bahamas, and even Florida probably in line for potentially a higher than normal probability for landfalling systems sometime in the month of August. And then the same thing holds true into September. It kind of wavers a little bit with that high pressure system out here with that Bermuda high over the eastern tropical Atlantic. So we may have more of a southern track at times, more of a northern track at times, kind of wishy-washy through the month of September, but we will see the signal there still for the greater Antilles and the southeast, and always September is usually the bigger months we have to watch out for for tropical systems as well. So we'll continue to monitor that, and then even as we go into October, still the signal is there. Um, the eastern Pacific could really get heated up there into October, and even into November as well, kind of a mixed signal, more of the Caribbean in play there as we go deeper into the hurricane season. So from September to October, October into November, the Caribbean is going to be probably the most prime area for tropical weather this hurricane season. The Gulf will probably be, probably be more below normal with our tropical weather um, as well. With that Bermuda high so far south, it's going to be difficult to get that up into the Gulf, but we still could see some development even as we go into August. I think August will be the biggest month for the southeastern United States. So here's my tropical season predictions for the Atlantic, the Caribbean, and the Gulf of Mexico. Bodies of water there. My name storms, 13 to 16. I expect 13 to 16 storms named this season across those bodies of water. I expect 4 to 7 hurricanes as well. 0 to 3 major hurricanes. There may not be a major hurricane, or there could be as many as 3. There is a possibility of that as well. And my forecast for U.S. landfalling storms, I think there will at least be one 
one landfalling system sometime this hurricane season, whether it is a tropical depression, a tropical storm, a hurricane, or a major hurricane. I think one at least to as many as four are possible into the south or, uh, the southeastern United States as well. So we'll continue to monitor that as we get a little bit closer through the hurricane season. Well, if you not are not subscribed to the YouTube channel, be sure to subscribe down below, especially if you like these long-range weather forecasts. I'll be doing more of these throughout the summer and into the fall, and especially even into the winter months as well. Or overall, if you like detailed weather breakdowns, Subscribe to the channel down below. I do cover North America, including Southern Canada, the United States, and the tropics on this channel. Also, press the like button. If you like today's video and all my videos, press the like button, the thumbs up to get all of this information out to as many people as possible. I do appreciate that, and it does help out more than you know. And it also, if you want to follow me on Twitter for additional weather forecast updates, hit the description down below the video and follow me on Twitter at hweather420. I do post on on there fairly frequently throughout the week and I will keep you updated with the latest weather forecast on there as well. Well, thank you guys so much for watching today's video. Again, be sure to subscribe, like the video down below, turn on post notifications so you get any live streams or video coverage for the weather forecast as well. Otherwise, thank you guys so much for watching today's video and I will see you all in the next video.